Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to uh, Off the Press, where we get to share major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. I'm starting with the Punch newspapers. Let's see what stories that we can find here. The first one there is uh, obviously on uh, uh, Sunday Bo. It says, uh, Ben Air rejected Boho's hasty extradition. Lawyers write Germany to stop moves. Ben Air insists on repatriation hearing to determine whether Igbo's guilty or not, says a lawyer. Legal team to file additional complaint with German embassy today on Igbo's arrest. On protest, Rocky Ibadan, Kotonou, in London, over activist arrest. Um, police attack or your protesters. Still on the punch this morning. Federal government implementing 7% tax waiver on aircraft and spares, says Onyema. Despite aggressive revenue drive, federal government suffers 1.4 trillion naira shortfall. Also, Nigeria lost 53.26 billion naira to gas flaring in two months, says the NNPC. Sanction officers involved in $274.2 million external loan losses, says the Senate. We can also see uh, 49 years of waiting, overgrown weeds, impassable roads tell Mambila Power Project stories of dashed hopes. And also, Baptists considering ransom for, uh, to free abducted students says we're boxed. Hijab-wearing lady paraded uh, fake name, uh, parading fake name rather, caught with 465 kilograms of drugs. And 13 killed as bus ramps into truck on Lagos Ibadan Expressway. These are the stories on the punch we can share this morning. On the Nation newspaper, the headline reads, COVID-19 infection rose by 77% in one week. Recovery rates drops by 87%. NCDC warns of deadly Delta variant. Above the headlines on the Nation newspaper, 2 million young Nigerians to get UNICEF job training. Residents protest over abandoned 22 billion Naira Akure Ado Road project. Generator fume kills family of four in Kwara. Nigeria, UAE in talks over gold illegally ferried to Dubai. Benin Republic here to arraign agitator Igbo. Police disperse protesters in Ibadan. Or your government uncovers 41 ghost workers. And the APC, APC is saying why we opt for consensus option. Below the headlines on the nation, don't destroy Nigeria's image. Presidency cautions. Dambazel slams Kuka. Media, not government political enemies, says editors. And lastly on the nation, Makinde talks tough on security. Now to the Daily Sun. Igboho protest rock Ibadan. Kotonou uh, court. Ghani Adams flays federal government's attempts to criminalize case. Media not supporting terrorists, as NGE cautions uh, NBC over controversial anti-media policies. Nine die, 16 injured on Lagos Ibadan Expressway accident. Um, Anambag gubernatorial elections, I'm ready to win, Ugo Chukuba is saying. Also again, gunmen strike in Bainway, kill 43 raise houses. Bauchi governor gives uh, emirs uh, marching orders over banditry. Also, return of looted artifacts, Edo Muslims back above Benin to take custody. And uh, also, shake up uh, in IPOB, Ekpa sacked as broadcaster for not following rules. These are the stories on the uh, Daily Sun newspapers. On the Daily Trust, insecurity, Zamfara, Kebi, Niger lead as gunmen kill 1,031 Nigerians in one month, 390 kidnapped, northwest, north central top fatality. Nigeria overwhelmed, needs help. That's according to a retired colonel. And a security expert here is saying how to reverse trend. 2023 will field consensus candidates. That's according to the APC. Kidnappers abduct six residents in Abuja. Federal government lost 50, 54. 0.1 billion naira in exchange rates on external loan. That's according to the Senate. Also in the Daily Trust, below the headlines, small-scale farmers raise alarm over poor access to fertilizer. By Elsa SSG's mother abducted. Gunmen kill three-month-old baby, 12 others in Benue. 
FG cancels 7% surcharge on aircraft spare parts. Uh, those are the stories we're looking at under the Daily Trust this morning. All right. Good morning, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Um, always a pleasure to be with you. Happy Salah to all our Muslim faithfuls. I was told that Plus TV Africa had sent a ram to me, but it was arrested along the way. I'm sure it will soon be released. So yeah. thank you in advance. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Good morning. All right, let's quickly start with the, of course, the story that makes the headlines across uh, all the papers this morning, and that is Sunday Boho's uh, case. Uh, it says that the uh, Benin Republic uh, you know, government has refused to, of course, comply with the Nigerian government's request. Um, what's your response to all that is currently playing out? The very first thing is that um, we have failed to prioritize issues. We've have failed to have what I call emotional intelligence concerning our national concerns. Um, we brought in Namdi Kanu. I don't know to what extent they thought they had scored a major victory in Nigeria as far as governance is concerned. Immediately after that, they went after Iboho. And I do not know if they think they've scored another victory. I don't know how they do the analysis. And then by the time you put all these things together, the question is, exactly what is the mindset of our people in government. And at this time, I would like to zero in on Mr. President. Exactly what is his mindset? Number one, when Namdi Khan was, um, was um, brought back the way he was, what was the feeling of the generality of Nigerians, North, South, East, and West? Now they've gone after Igoho, what is the feeling? Then we had our jet shot down, shot, brought down. Where is our priority? We have in one of the papers, a thousand people killed, over 390 under kidnap. Exactly what is the national discourse? What is the mindset of Mr. President? What's the priority of Mr. President? Within weeks or months of operation, IPOP was designated a ter terrorist organization. I have no problem with that. Now, compare the activities, the modus operandi of IPOP with that of the bandits. And how do we juxtapose, align the actions that we take as government and putting all this together, exactly where have we left right-thinking Nigerians, north, south, east, west? I know there are a lot of tribal sentiments, but I also know that there are Nigerians who are thinking Nigeria. I run one of the biggest groups in this country, Nigeria First Project, and I serve as a DG. In that group, I have my Fulani brethren. I have my Yoruba brethren, Anang, Efik. I have everybody represented. And when these people talk, they talk as Nigerians. I have seen an Igbo man comment in a very, very, very aggressive and unhurt manner on the way that the children of the North, who are so-called Almajuris, you know, are treated. And those that are paraded in the village, in the, in the forest, because of what they call the tradition. I've seen an Igbo man say, it's not fair. These are Nigerians. They deserve to go back to school like our children in the Southeast. I've also seen a man from the North, a Fulani person, be very angry with the way the devastation in Niger Delta. There are still Nigerians that think like Nigeria. So my question is, Mr. President, what is the real mindset of this Nigerians that think like Nigeria, when will you give us a nation? Hmm. Interesting. And uh, anyway, we'll be looking at this issue in detail later on on the show. On the Daily Trust newspaper, there's a story that reveals, you know, 
what Nigerians, many would say is shocking, others would say it doesn't come as a surprise, that 1,031 Nigerians were killed in one month in Zamfara, Kebi, and Niger State, with 390 others kidnapped. My, Mr. Yaitog, how do you see the story? It's, 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 it's infuriating, it's nauseating, it's, I wish I could find the word to use. We were in this country when one American was captured and how the American government bent over backwards, undertook an operation and rescued that one person, one. Then in one month, we are having over 1,000 Nigerians killed. And it's like, oh, we are going for consensus uh, for our next presidency. Oh, uh, it should be zoned to the east and the west, north and south. Oh, it's all about politics. And I don't blame these people. I, honestly, sincerely, I think that a dog will always bark. A cat will always meow. It is an unintelligent person that will expect a dog to meow or be angry with a cat that refuses to bark. These people should be known for who they are. They are political entrepreneurs. The act of governance is really not on their plate at all. And for us, I, I stop blaming politicians that are in power because they came into power not to serve us. They came into power for, as an enterprise. That's why they sold their houses. They have mortgaged their souls to the devil for them to be able to get to power. And we collected their money from them. We collected the rights. We collect, I saw a video in, uh, from Ghana where this politician brought a truckload of you no know, items. And the people said, no, please take the items, but we don't want. Give us jobs. Are you going to give me this to eat every day for the next four years? No, you are not. So please tell me how you are going to create jobs for me. I don't want, to, I don't want these things again. If Ghanaians that we call, you know, you know there's, an, um, there's this body language where the Nigerian sees himself as more sophisticated, more endowed, more cerebral, more aware, more you know, than, than the average Ghanaian. And here, Ghanaians are teaching us lessons in governance and, 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 and do rightness. The time has come when the youth of this country should wake up and discover that their country, their future, have been completely, this concept of leaders of tomorrow have said it. Youth are not leaders of tomorrow. Children are leaders of tomorrow. Youth are leaders of today. At 21, I had my first degree. You call me leader of tomorrow. 23, I had my master's, leader of tomorrow. At 30, 25, I married. At 31, I had my three children. At 37, I became the first Nigerian to get a facility for Shelter Africa in this country. And you call me leader of tomorrow. Does it make sense? Now the youth age has been moved to 45. They are gradually moving into 50 because they are now moving the age, the youth age bracket higher and higher because the youth are not standing up those to wake up and seize their country. You know, not violence, no, no, nobody should lose their soul. So bottom line is this, how do we feel that in one month, 1,000 Nigerians are killed while in the same period, 390 others are waiting for their parents to sell their house shut down their businesses, do everything humanly possible, destroy their lives, terminate their lives, to get ransom to pay, even also, they are on the slaughter plate already. And Nigerian leaders, so-called, can still talk about 2023 and politics. Wow. Please, fellow Nigerians, and look at what's happening in the National Assembly, what a shame. I dare them. I double dare them. This is not violence. No, 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 no. Let them not pass that electronic transmission of results. Look at APC. APC says everybody's coming. Oh, we are getting larger. They are defecting. Good for you. But why are you afraid? If these are facts, why are you afraid to go on what is, what is, what is, you know, seen globally as best practice? Electronic. Now for the man who came from NCC, and say that NCC coverage is 52%. I wait for our senators to bring him back, or our lawyers, whoever the set of people, to bring him back and put him to justify that. Because if he misled this, the, the country, he cannot, he cannot be swept under the carpet. 
Something has to be done to that man who ought to know and came to the Senate and said that the, the, the 2G, 3G coverage of Nigeria is about 50%. When, as I two, three years back, they, the NCC, they had said it was about 75%. All right, and then talk. in the budget, in the last budget, there was about 15 billion provision for, you know, the, the, the extra capacity to expand network. These discussions we go talk about, I'm telling you, time has come. We can't sit on the fence again. I won't. All right, Mr. Ayatoka, let's still talking about the Senate. There's a story on the, um, on the punch this morning that talks about uh, sanctioning officers involved in $274.2 million external loan losses. It's from the Senate. And I'll share what it says. It says, uh, during the examination of Note 51 and Appendix to Note 52, it was observed that there was a total exchange loss difference of $278.2 million. That's about 54.1 billion naira. Reported by the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation in the document provided, but this could not be found in the Debt Management Office uh, document. So it seems like some funds may be missing here or there, or, or you know, documentation might be a problem. I'm not sure which it is. But the Senate is asking for sanctions for those responsible. They should not ask for sanctions of those responsible. They should ask for criminal proceedings, prosecution, not sanctions. What is sanction? I don't understand. Maybe I'm not a lawyer, so maybe that's a technical term. I don't know. But I think that anybody that is part of the fraud system, if Mr. President is serious, I mean, it's never too late to do the right thing. Right now, I personally had, had lost my, my hope long ago on this question of integrity on fighting corruption. But I think that I want to be pleasantly surprised and I will not mind if it starts today. Mm. When you hear this amount of money, it is mind-boggling. And yet, we cannot have basics. My brother, I'm in Akwaibo. Akwaibo is one of the richest states in this country. And I'm telling you, I mean, I will not come on national television to castigate our, my own state. But I'm telling you that if I'm to use Akwaibo as a yardstick on what poverty is doing to the average Nigerian, then I feel awful about what is probably happening into certain, certain states, certain areas that don't have one-tenth of what we have. And yet in size, there are three times who we are. So if I'm to use our state as a yardstick, then I bleed for this country. And people are moving money in billions and trillions in droves, public funds, abusing public trust that they, they took an oath to defend. The Senate should go beyond, uh, you know, sanction the people. They should right. bring this report out. You know, in the last budget in Aquaibom, said I did something. For once, I brought out the Auditor General's report, put it in the public for everybody to see, and men did it go, mm -hmm. I don't know which direction to call it. And that time has come. All the leaders, you call yourself elitists or elites and their leaders, go to your state, dig up the budget, get the Auditor General's budget, Make it public to the people because government must start to be accountable. And the time to start was yesterday. Next best time is today. Okay, so um, talking about 2023 elections, we've heard the APC speak. They're saying that um, regarding the presidential elections, they will not let individual um, ambitions to supersede uh, or derail the Buhari administration, and that instead they will seek a consensus candidate. This is a story uh, that we've seen on the Punch newspaper as well, um, insisting that they will seek a consensus candidate. Um, what do you say to this? Because regarding 2023 and the APC, there's been lots of allegations by the PDP that, you know, there's a Buhari third term agenda. No, it's not, it's not Buhari third term agenda. Buhari will not as much as contemplate a third term agenda unless you're talking in terms of, um, you know, a rule by in by proxy. But in terms of him, you see, Nigerians pray daily for God to give him good health to exit on a place of glory. If he gets to this stage of his life and he knows what his health was like before he became president, he knows what nearly hit him while he was president. But many people, including myself, 
went out of our way to pray for God to keep him alive, to, to help him to, 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 to complete, not just complete, but to finish strong. He should not take the grace of God for granted. He should not. That is my honest advice to him. So I don't think that he's having any third-term agenda. I think that APC lacks strategic planning, strategic management of the affairs. They have hinged on one man. Oh, his integrity, his integrity. And suddenly, they are discovering that the man is exiting the stage and they had no fallback plan. As soon as the man started his second term, the wisest thing to have done was to gradually move from his integrity to our party, from his integrity to our party. By the time he's gone halfway, the attention is focused on our party. We are doing this, we are doing that, our party, our party, and people are starting to come to APC. Sorry, I nearly said ADC. ADC is actually, by the way, the party that I'm in right now, and they are doing well, but let's not go there. People would be coming to APC because of the party. That is wisdom. But they've not been able to do that. And suddenly they are discovering that, wow, the man is living field. And then, have you noticed that in the electoral bill amendment, that part to try to make direct primaries to be compulsory is one of the areas giving them that, you know, a headache because they want to go on consensus. You know, not just indirect, they want to do consensus. Because you can do direct, you can do indirect, you can do consensus. It's allowed in party, mani you know, um, not manifestos, in party, how can I forget, whatever it is, you know, how, how, uh, uh, constitutions. So I think that APC is, you know, everybody, like I said earlier, they claim that people are coming to the party in droves. Question number one, is it because the party is doing so well that everybody wants to run in? Or well, this the house that is collapsing? and a sane man wants to run into a collapsing house, there must be something we will interrogate. And when they look at it and discover that if they are to go for direct primaries, they are going to completely demystify themselves because the numbers just won't add up. On the other hand, there will be nothing, no central figure to, to hold them together. The day that the president leaves office, trust me, is on his way to, to his place in Daura to take care of his cows and everything, all right? So APC, they are neither here nor there. The same uh -huh. with PDP. What we need is a third force, which is a credible alternative. And I'm very happy with the management of um, ADC, who are stepping into this gap and then um, creating governance that is based on cerebral content and not because of size of pocket. Okay. There's right. hope um, of Nigeria and ADC last, recommended plans. Finally, um, uh, I think we can squeeze your thoughts in on the um, Baptist students. Uh, the report on the point says a Baptist uh, considering ransom to free their abducted students. Um, it also says uh, they are boxed in, uh, I guess, in a tight spot. You know, also quickly, in, if you can, in the, just a minute, share your thoughts on, um, you know, how long this has taken. And, you know, it doesn't seem like the government has the answers. The, the government would have the answer based on their priority. Do they care? Do they care? Could they be bothered? Look at Leah Sharibu, a woman that Mr. President would have made a statement on. Now I'm calling her a woman. Now I'm calling her a woman. Because what else do you call a mother of, we're told, one or two children, right? Does he really care? Do they really care? I feel pain. I want to imagine, I, I can't even, I don't want to even as much as imagine, the mindset of the parents of these children and the ruthlessness, the heartlessness of these terrorists that we have refused to call them so. The parents are selling their houses, they are shutting down their businesses, they are doing everything possible. I just want to appeal to these terrorists. I, I, I beseech you by the mercies of God, have mercy on these people, on these on this poor parents. They, they don't have the money you want. They don't have. They've sold their houses. They've sold all they have. They've, they've sold their life. What they've worked for all their life, they've sold. These are poor people trying to make ends meet. I want to appeal to you. Have mercy on them. I beg you. All right. Zazikia and I talk. Thank you so much, as always, uh, for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us. We wish you a very interesting day ahead. Thank you. And we pray that that uh, RAM is released pretty soon.
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's take a break here and we'll return with uh, Today in History. I'm going back to the year 1995. We'll be back. <laughs>